All right. Well, thank you. That was terrific. Um, great to be here with all of you and excited to share a few lessons uh, around building Bloomreach and the, and the uses of data throughout building the company. And, and this is definitely a topic that's near and dear to my heart. You know, when we started Bloomreach, I would say now almost nine years ago, the original intuition was that great customer experiences are going to be powered by data science and machine learning and techniques like we all understand today. Today, that's, that's a well understood thing. Uh, several years ago, it certainly wasn't. And so we definitely have the scars uh, to have gone through the journey of, of building a, what I think will be a, a great enterprise software business with data at its core. So what I'll tell you today is just a little bit about the business, a little bit about how really many of our customers use our products and the lessons along the way uh, of, of what we learned in the process of making great customer experiences come to reality in the process uh, to do so. So just, just a very quick uh, overview of the company. The company has uh, about 270 people. It really was built on this kind of global data and, and machine learning and AI platform with massive volumes of peak requests, with huge amounts of, of digital interactions. We power almost 20% of e-commerce transactions in the US at some point hit a Bloomreach server of, uh, of some kind, and huge amounts of data sets, things like uh, billions of synonym pairs in the English language, one example of a data set that we process in order to uh, understand what it takes to, to drive a great customer experience. We've got a very diverse group of enterprises that use our platform, so everybody from retailers to banks to manufacturers to uh, governments to financial institutions, a wide range of people that, that run on the Bloomreach platform. Um, and then, and then the uh, thank you to the people who gave us money. Um, a little bit about how we see the world, just, just to put our platform in context. The way we see the world is more and more every enterprise has three core platforms that power their digital experience or their digital business. They have an acquisition platform, commonly called a marketing cloud, but some way by which to get customers to come in the door. We're not in that business. The business we're in is once you drive customers in the door, Give them, give them a great experience in the moment of truth. And that is the core of the digital experience platform that we build. And then we often hand it off to a system of record, an ERP system or a uh, commerce platform or other transactional engine, and we don't play there. So our entire world centers around your experience, particularly when you engage with a website or app or other digital interaction point that enterprises have spent great money getting you to come visit. Um, Lots about the technology here, but really the point I wanted to point out here is we sell applications, we provide analytics and tools, but at the end of the day, what's underneath the iceberg is really data and a platform. And so Bloomreach has, is always, you know, I struggle to describe it about whether it's a software company or whether it's a data company, because really one without the other has no value. Uh, we took a large data set around understanding customers and around understanding the mapping of customers to their intent and ultimately that intent to products and services. And we took that data set, applied a whole bunch of algorithms, and really the original mission of the company was imagine if we could make every individual interaction amazing using that data set and applying algorithms against it. So the whole company is based on data. There is no, there would be no bloom reach without data and the and the algorithms and data science applied on top of that that then manifest in a whole range of applications that I'll show you. So I th I'll, I'll step through a number of examples of, of how people use our platform. And in so doing, I think you'll, we'll, we'll start to talk about lessons. So here's, a, here's, the, here's the original Bloomreach product that we built nine years ago, which is you go to a place like Google, you type in something like, I'm looking for concrete pendant lighting because I'm looking to, to redecorate um, a garage or something of that kind. I get a page of this kind. It's a page that sells lighting, except the detail around this is that this page and this client, in this case Lumens, this entire page was algorithm generated. So the algorithm figured out that there's demand on the web for people looking for concrete pendant lighting, that this retailer in this case had the products but never built this page. The machines built this page anticipating the demand, which then causes in the future when you go search on Google for this page to arrive there, you click through and you become a customer of Lumen. So that's an, an example of one of the applications that's built on our platform. And an application of this kind, this was how the business was, was originally started. And I would say the number one lesson that we learned in the course of building this application is that data sources equal platform dependency. Because this data set was so fundamentally about search, was so fundamentally about people searching on Google, 
often as companies get bigger and bigger, we think hard about what represents platform dependency. And there is arguably no bigger platform dependency than if your data largely comes from a consolidated set of sources, which in that application, so much of it was search because so much of customer acquisition was driven by Google. But fundamentally, what we learned from that experience is that be very careful about what your data sources are because downstream, they represent a level of platform dependency. Here's another application on the Bloomreach platform. In this case, you're, you're searching for maybe black heels, maybe black hoodie, maybe black hat. But the small example of, of what's called the auto-suggest, which all of us use every day in all kinds of different applications and is an example of an application built on the Bloomreach platform. Well, one of, the, one of the interesting lessons here, maybe a bit more on the technology side here, is we spent a lot of, of really years optimizing the auto-suggest algorithm. And I think what we learned from that fundamentally, is that speed is more important than quality, which is more important than optimization. And what do I mean by that? You know, in, in the course of building the first versions of AutoSuggest, they, were, they returned data back at the level of about 150 milliseconds. Today, they return data back at the level of 10 milliseconds. And the delta between that was more important than anything we did to make the action better. So in the course of thinking through data and data science and applying it to real world problems, I think one, you know, one of the things we've learned is think about speed first before you think about quality. Now, th thinking about quality, well, quality is really important. It's just simply good auto-suggest. You and I could go look at it and say, does it make sense? And earlier on, we used to think, OK, let's do a bunch of really sophisticated stuff. Let's do semantic uh, query understanding. Let's do revenue optimization. Let's personalize all of these auto-suggests. And it turned out nothing was more important than it just making sense. And so I think the lesson from the building of this very simple capability that all of us use every day is to prioritize what, we're, what, what metric we're, we're ultimately building our products against in what priority order. They all mattered eventually, but they mattered at different degrees. Here's an example of just search, which all of us use every day in this example. Well, I finally land at the hoodie, and I come back, and you know this is the typical experience. The Bloomreach experience would be a personalized one and one optimized for revenue, for browsing behavior. So the algorithms are basically figuring out the sort order of the hoodies without any human intervention in the mix. Well, the lesson from this is really that when you look at that, it looks awesome. Well, you know, before, you used to just return the search results, and it was owned by the customer what the quality of that was. Well, today, because this is a handshake between our SaaS environment and the customer's data, that, that handshake requires a completely different uh, model for customer success and support. Because what we have learned in being a data science plus SaaS company is we are accountable ultimately for what the results of the data return back in the application, which of course are a function of the quality of the data that the customer provides us in the first place. So in a strange way, it totally changes the needs. You start getting support calls that say, how come my search results suck? And it turns out it has nothing to do with the search engine, right? It has to do with the data that came in, and that data may or may not be controlled by us. Your customer success people all of a sudden have to think a lot more deeply about the value of a solution that's totally different than workflow software in terms of thinking about value to a customer. Um, here's, here's another application. This, this one totally outside of retail. We power a lot of online banks. And in this example, you know, we're powering online banks that, that uh, in terms of their website and their online banking, we're powering the apps, we're powering the teller experiences. So we're powering a number of digital touch points for, uh, for large online banks. And initially, when we were thinking about this, we had grown up in e-commerce, and we thought, OK, banking, well, how, how different could banking be than e-commerce? And what we have learned, of course, is that all data science and all AI and all ML is fundamentally vertically specific, which is the dirty secret about AI and ML-powered businesses. They are fundamentally vertical problems. And why we believe that when we hear marketing terms like Einstein or Sensei or pick your other dead male inventor, that, that approach applied to a horizontal set of software problems simply doesn't make sense because the, the interesting stuff, recruiting data or hiring data or our data related to individual sites is ultimately vertical specific. And so the hard lesson we learned from this is that we would we, either we would have to figure out how to build recommendation systems and data-driven experiences for every vertical on the planet, or ultimately we'd have to open up the platform in such a way where it can be verticalized by partners. And, and that is ultimately the road that we went down to tackle the vertical specificity of customer experiences. Um, you know, one of my favorite examples is we power uh, the uh, soccer team Bayern Munich. 
And Bayern Munich, and this is not just the, the websites, this is the apps, and this is when you walk into the stadium in Munich, the system will understand who your favorite soccer player is. You will have been a fan of that soccer player. You will be able to have an augmented reality experience with that soccer player. And then, of course, they'll sell you a jersey on the way out of the stadium. Right? So this is the quality of experience that, that we're talking about here. In fact, they think about this as sports innovation. In fact, Bayern Munich now describes itself not as a soccer club, uh, but rather a sports innovation platform. And I think what I've learned from, from this is really that innovation mostly happens outside of your product. And I think we as entrepreneurs often think really hard about the stuff we're building and the use cases and, and the MVPs and the scenarios and so on and so forth. And I can't tell you how few of them we have foreseen as we have turned this digital experience platform into an open ecosystem for innovation by our partners and by our customers. The stuff they do is much cooler than the stuff we anticipated. You know, one of the things we, we didn't do early is build tools. And so today, the Bloomreach platform isn't just APIs and real-time experiences. It's a number of tools. And, and this was a hard lesson. The lesson was basically white box is much better than black box. And, and when we started the company, it was a black box company. You gave it a URL. We returned the perfect web page. And I remember my co-founder being like, why would the customer care as long as the metrics are better? Uh, but of course, that's not true. Because in the end, uh, people care a lot about the quality of experiences they're demonstrating. And until we could build tools like the ones that we did, even if those tools, by the way, are never used, it's still much more important to the client to have an understanding of how the machine makes decisions in order to trust it. And trust is, of course, the basis for any data-driven business. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what I have learned centers around the number of people that touch the digital experience. So when we think about an online bank or a sports team or a retailer, there's a lot of people involved in that mix. Marketers, CEOs, e-commerce people, developers, um, you know, merchandisers, content folks, all of whom touch the experience you know, together. And, and you know, I think, I think often, at least for me, the lesson is it's, it's about the people, it's not about the machines, right? And we forget that in the, in, in the thinking around algorithms and the quality of data and big and small data and various AI techniques and, and, and the like, that at the end of the day, if people can't interpret it, if people can't make sense of it, if people can't trust it, then it really doesn't matter what you did. And so biasing in favor of simpler and more understanding across all of these different roles has been a key learning for us in, in building this business. So now I get to eight, nine, and 10, just because I had to have 10, frankly. Um, one, I, I think we, uh, lesson number eight, there is no stickiness in, in data-driven optimization. So data-driven, data, uh, you know, uh, data -driven, I think, is a, is a great name for this event, because fundamentally, it's not a space unto itself. It's an addition to every space. And when we, when we originally thought about Bloomreach, the, the company was a data company. We would literally say, hey, give us an API, we'll optimize any page, and we'll use algorithms to do it. And it was really that simple. But of course, that's not ultimately very sticky, because if you're an API call away and a, and a black box algorithm away, then you're only as good until the next smart entrepreneur calls me and says, well, I've got a better black box and a better API that you should plug in and try. And so what I've learned over the, over the course of building this business is that, it, is that at least in software, enterprise software, the value of data science is, is hugely valuable as a source of differentiation, but it's only valuable if presented along with either a workflow problem or an infrastructure problem. But it's gotta be one of those two. Lesson number nine, AI and ML has zero value in marketing. We all have to do it because we have to say that we do AI or ML or something of that type. But at this point, the customer just simply can't, doesn't care. It's just, no, you know, it's noise, right? It's in one ear and out the other ear because it's just the new name for what they feel like has existed in the past. And maybe lesson number 10 is, um, is, is that you know, there's, there's such a labor crunch around engineers with experience around ML and AI, certainly in Silicon Valley, for sure. Um, and I think, I think what I've learned from this is that a lot, lots of back-end engineers who've been amazing have developed great skills in this area. It is totally learnable and, and not that hard to learn with appropriate uh, application of time and effort. And for sure, if you're an entrepreneur building a business around uh, use of data and data science, you don't have to pay what the unnamed tech monopolists play, pay. No, no name being given 
to the tech monopolists. Um, but but that, that, isn't, that isn't necessary in order to source the kind of talent you need uh, to succeed in a data-driven business. So, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. How do, how do you train them? How do you take uh, engineers and turn them into machine learning engineers? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, first of all, um, the number of engineers taking courses on the side is like 100%, you know, especially in, in, this machine, area, learning. in machine learning, yes. right? So it, it, you don't need a, you actually, they're pretty self-motivated individuals in the first place. And the second is, of course, anybody who, is, who has thought about this problem realizes like the pre-processing and the post-processing is a much bigger part of the problem than the actual modeling itself, much of which exists in, in open source domains. It's the practical application of that. So you know, when you start getting into problem areas, you start to find that really the, what you need to solve a practical problem is like 20% algo and 80% systems you know, in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we have found that just good back-end engineering skills with mentorship and application against a problem and self-motivation is a pretty effective combination. Great. So what does the organization look like in terms of precisely engineers and data scientists? Um, who does what, where? Yeah, so first of all, we don't have any data scientists. We only mm -hmm. have engineers understand. who understand data science. Right. And, and that is a key, key approach to our software development process because we think that you know, a data scientist sitting off to the side it can only just generate reports. Ultimately, if you want to build products, they have to be engineers. And they have to have familiarity kind of with those groups. So we may have component areas where the data science is applied, but we don't have a data science team. The entire engineering team has people with expertise around ML and AI, except maybe the pure serving infrastructure folks who are purely doing systems work. And have you guys found that using open source stuff um, helps you get there faster? Or what I've found is using open source stuff to start makes sense, and then there's just a ton to do to apply it against a specific problem, which is where the work is. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by whether it's vertical specific or use case specific, the distance from what exists in the open source domain to a practical tuned application of that is high, uh, and that's the work. And just for context, when, when you mentioned the switch, or the, when you added banking to your e-commerce vertical, how, how long did that take to precisely tune and, and build a whole? Yeah, I think, I think what we did is try and fail you know, with, a, with a couple of verticals, actually, and then realize that what we need to do is open up the core APIs for things like recommendations and search and analytics and personalization, and targeting, and a bunch of core capabilities, and then partner with systems integrators and uh, ISVs, application developers, to build the vertical specific applications. So we wound up not you building the data science aspect of this. Op uh, opening up intelligence capabilities and then enabling the third parties to do things like control inputs, control weights, control goals, control optimization functions. So giving them enough tools to build the intelligent applications on our platform. Interesting. That that worked with the system totally. integrators. So totally. Okay. Very yeah. interesting. What's interesting as well is every one of those guys is mandated to build an ML and AI practice as well. Uh, yes. So they, they have untrained people looking for something interesting to do. Yes. Or they have trained people looking for something interesting to interesting, do. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, I guess, one of the last points that was uh, ML and AI had no marketing value, but, but it helps with this type of thing, right? That's true. With uh, That's true. partners and recruiting and all this. That's okay. true. Cool. Uh, questions? Yeah. How would you suggest to somebody who's actually done that themselves, person who started going on and now they're bouncing out, or how do you go from there and just do it? Like, just kind of think things to think about your process. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we, in fact, I recall an offer we made to an engineer last week in which the person said, well, okay, I only want to accept this offer if you put me on a machine learning project. And, and I think it's, it's a great example of what not to do. Because the truth of the matter is, these classes of technologies are going to touch everything. So it's just simply, it's not about looking for something that is a direct match to what you studied. It's just simply looking for a high quality technical job in a high quality company solving interesting problems. And then the rest takes care of itself from there. So in a strange way, I would be a little less 
specific. I would just find high quality environments and get in. Uh, and then work your way to the specific problem space. The actual problems are not as pure as, as one would think. So you're a B2B business, so what that means is that your paying customers might be different from your end users. Yes. So as an example, going along with your example of the black hoodies, how do you strike a balance between what they want? If your customer doesn't like the order in which the black hoodies are presented, while you have shown through A-B test that, that, the, that the current order that we present is the one that will drive you higher revenue, how do you, how do you sort of balance that and what does the conversation sound like with you and your customers? Yeah, yeah, it, you know, it, it's interesting. It's, a gr it's, it's actually not a trade-off that has been hard to arbitrate because to use a very specific example of the one that you talked about, you know, we might optimize for something like revenue per visit. And revenue per visit ultimately factors in, you have to click a lot, you have to browse a lot, you have to add to cart, you probably have to buy. You know, so it, there is a fair amount of, in a sense, a customer who buys, that's the strongest vote that they can give about what they like and what experience they actually like. So there's a pretty high degree of correlation between optimizing for something like revenue or revenue per visit with what the user actually desires, which is why user feedback algorithms like Google work really well because the more you click on a result, the more you tell Google that you like that result better than the one above it, and then Google learns from that experience. We, largely, we do the same thing. The, the exceptions to that are cases where you know, there's something highly personalizable about an individual. And, and in that case, we ultimately leave it in the control of the enterprise to determine how much they want to weight user-specific signals versus business-specific signals. That's a decision that they make for their clients. For their users. Where's Jack? The lady over there. Thanks. Um, there's been a lot of chat recently about using ML and AI algorithms to show their work. Um, what are your thoughts on how that might be enacted or whether or not you can work with it better? You know, I think it's a, I think it's a really good thing, uh, but I don't. I think when you talk about show your work, it has to be show your work where the average layperson can understand the work. So showing the work in a deeply technical way has some value, but very few people will ultimately read it or understand it. The most valuable show your work is if you can show the intuition, you know, behind what you're doing, which is not often easy in certain AI cases. But I'll tell you what we did. At a certain point, our customers kept asking us, how is the algorithm making a decision about what to do? And so what we did is we built an analytics tool and sold something to them. So we effectively turned the question into a product and then monetized the product, which might be a bit mercenary, but it worked pretty well. I had one last question over there. This question if I'm wrong, but I would imagine that the space you're in is very competitive and very crowded. And so what is your company at a building competitor? How do you win over the customers? Yeah, at, at, at this point, you know, the, the company is at a scale where I would say our largest competitor is the Adobe stack. So Adobe has about a one and a half billion dollar software business in our space, and they're the leader in our space, and we admire them a lot. Um, and when we think about you know them versus us. It's everything that's modern. So, you know, there's a monolithic piece of software. Ours is an API-driven kind of software. You know, there, a lot of their stuff is on-premise. A lot of what we do is in the cloud. A lot of what they do is layer on little bits of data-driven optimization. The entire core of Bloomreach was built with this kind of uh, data-driven foundation. Uh, a lot of what they do is a closed stack. A lot of what we do is an open platform that you can you can plug in multiple different kinds of pieces to build your experience. So it's it's. I just think it's like from this century is the simple source of differentiation. All right, one last question. Um, I was just curious Yeah, GDPR has been a huge topic. I would say it, it's impacted us in two ways. One is we as a company have to be GDPR compliant, of course, and we've done that and 
that's a big part of our promise to our, our clients, and you know, we've undertaken the processes for that. The bigger thing has actually been how it's driven our business. So many of our clients, in the context of building these customer experiences, have created these very fragmented customer experiences that make it impossible for them to comply with GDPR in terms of, of deletion of data and all kinds of things of that type. So it has driven this idea of a digital experience platform because it's one platform through which customer experiences are defined and administered. And so then, if you want to do something like a user says, delete my profile, you can do it in one place and centrally manage the compliance of something like that to comply with GDPR. So it's actually been an interesting business driver for a platform like ours. All right, on this note, thank you so much. This cool. was terrific, great enjoyment. Thank you.